Prof, I want to start with you because there's someone here who seems to be struggling a little bit with uh, with uh, with with what you've shared around digitization, and that's that's Yolanda. And she says the events industry has been slow to pivot to virtual in Kenya. Events contracts came to a complete halt, especially with government agencies who are waiting for direction. We have done research on virtual events since March, and it will not be before August that we will be back to work. What is this resistance to virtual? And, and I'm just curious what more you have to say to people in, an, in a space like events where digitization, I don't know, it doesn't feel so straightforward that digitization is the answer. Well, um, I think Lon has uh, responded to some of this. That look at the problem and get the get what you need to do. Uh, yeah. It doesn't mean that events, stop, um, but you need to find the pain point uh, where you can revive the enterprises. Who, who organizes like these webinars, for example? Um, mm. and, and and be able to be the source where you go. You could even suggest to some organizations, let me organize an event like this. For you. It is important that your message goes out there, I would organize this. All you need to do is subscribe to one of these platforms and organize the speakers. Uh, this mm. is what people don't do. There are several organizations which uh, which actually haven't communicated to the customers. Um, mm. And you could have a, a, a conference like that. And soon, everybody would come to you. I, I'm just saying, for example, um, then there, there's a huge opportunity in education. And mm. I, I, I bring it because Loble uh, knows what is happening, that education is moving from what it was the industrial period where you put standard one, two, three, four, to a more yeah. customized, uh, customized a child, you know, and organize at the uh, estates and uh, and and educate and get some people to teach in, in the distance uh, where they are social distances themselves. We have so many teachers, even those who don't have employment, we would change the whole narrative. Ask yourself, what if this thing goes for another two years? We wait until we put them in class or we innovate and say, no problem. Those who are going to do KCB in December, we have groups of teachers. That is the work of an organizer who gets the teachers who are idle to get extra income, who gets the parents. Uh, and the ministry says, okay, the exam is going to go on. Uh, of course, people would argue that those who don't have resources in the village will not do that. That is yeah. where the money is. You actually go there, organize the kids who are just playing soccer at home there, and you get the teachers who are... There is a teacher in every village who is idle now. There is a, a student in every village who can't get a teacher to teach. What needs is a third person to come and say, we can organize this and provide education to the young people. That's a mega opportunity that, that is lying idle. If not that, then mobilize and get uh, smartphones uh, donated. I know Alex has three or four older smartphones because he has switched to the latest uh, uh, of these ones. Donate those three that you have. We go yeah. to the village and we educate people because a lot of content online today you mm. can actually study from online uh, by being mobilized by event organizers but yeah. that is not the only thing they should do or focus or cry that uh, this is dead i saw another lady who used to be an event now she cooks at home and have the food delivered to people who can't cook you know uh, apparently there are so many that is how several american restaurants are succeeding here uh, domino's pizza hut mm. they don't care if you close for five years because their model is to deliver to people's home there are people who can't cook so um you get into that and mm. just organize and get 
a cook who has been laid off from a hotel, and they say, and advertise and say, a chef from a five-star hotel would prepare the food for you, would deliver it to your home. You don't have to deliver because we have logistics firms. We have sendings, we have all, all kinds of delivery bearers and stuff. That is the work of an event organizer. You have organized something which will probably give you more sustainable income than probably what you are doing in, in large uh, weddings and other stuff from government. I thought what you said was very uh, interesting. I, and I think that's where the proof is in the pudding is uh, the ability for that person to think outside the box on how they're going to reinvent themselves. And I think one of the good examples is right here with this webinar. APSA is doing a, a great job of continuing to build a relationship with its clients through these webinars and, and providing uh, a value. And so, and, and, and there might be smaller businesses that don't have the facilities to run these type of webinars, you know? And this might be an opportunity for that person to, to create these type of uh, APSA type uh, events where they're building connection with customers for a small fee. Thank you guys for sharing that. Uh, Roble, I was, going to, I was going to bring a debate point uh, to you here. Uh, Airbnb has, has, has lovers and, and, and haters. And, and you know, I've been in different innovation conversations where uh, some people are saying Airbnb is dead, right? And, and, and you know, everything they've been doing is not, it's not, it's not uh, it doesn't make sense in the new normal anymore. There's another school, and I can see a point here which I'm going to read for you, says, I do not think Airbnb is going away simply because it operates from a micro scale and is highly flexible. In fact, it is the big guys who must change their ways. Airbnb offers personalized service, which is missing in the others. Uh, I just want to hear, what are your thoughts around Airbnb and from, just from the perspective of adapting to what's happening to them? I know they're facing a lot of challenges right now. Yeah, uh, one thing I would say is in this world, in this, uh, I don't, uh, there are no certainties in life. And uh, I put that, uh, put that statement on my uh, presentation, not as a fact, as just a discussion that is having, happening in the marketplace. Um, yeah, Airbnb has an opportunity to adapt and uh, it will probably come out uh, and with, it's not going to be the same Airbnb. It's not going to be the same Airbnb that it was before. And yeah. uh, um, I think a large number of their services was in-house. So I think um, in Kenya, a lot of, I don't know what the ratio is, because I, when I come to Kenya, I also rent Airbnbs. But a lot of times I rent complete uh, apartments. But uh, a lot in the US and in other places, with people renting rooms. So mm. when is that fear gonna and subside and and so and it it's not gonna I'm not expecting it to die. It has a lot of cash, but it's not gonna mm. be the same business. And and the yeah. question is, um, you know, how will it look afterwards? And and that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. And I'm not willing to uh, state a position either way. You know, I'm not gonna bet against Airbnb. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. You've, you've, yeah, yes, Prof. Going nowhere because um, even in the US, there are several people who rent multiple apartments for Airbnb, uh, meaning temporal, where you want one week, two, two days, three, four days. And even in Westlands, most of the restaurants now are under, under Airbnb, meaning that I don't need to go to somebody's home. I mean, I. If I had money and bought five apartments, furnish them well, and Alex wants two, three, one week, um, I will still give it to you. And there are still people traveling from other parts of the world. As long as the tourism is back, Airbnb is not going to die. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I want, there's a point I'm hanging on to, which is the point around cash uh, and cash reserves that Roble alluded to. And of course, you know, with everything that's going on right now, cash is king more than it has ever been before because that's where you even have the ability to, to sort of sift through. And, and, I, and I've spoken to a lot of entrepreneurs who've had to really rethink 
their cash management strategies to be able to survive, you know, sort of the, the low revenue period that they are going through. And Lona, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna just hear a little bit of your thoughts around this. And and as you answer that, there's a question that came through from Elizabeth uh, Maloba, and she says, in an environment where cash conservation is critical, how can businesses invest in innovative technologies and new strategies and models when they are not sure of the returns? And and I I really resonate with that fear. It's it's I'm not going to risk my cash in experiments. I need this cash to pay my people to keep the lights on and all that. So what thoughts do you have on that? Um, what what I would encourage entrepreneurs out there, hmm. uh, if you have an idea, just start it. Uh, somehow cash normally follows uh, when you're something when you're something to show for it. I remember when I was starting out, we did not even have enough capital to do anything, even to just even pay very little rent. It was only 10,000 shillings for the space that we required. Um, and I knew for me to be able to do that capital intensive business, I required a machine worth several million and all that. I used to write on a check, a blank check, uh, the amount of money that I wanted, I needed for the business. And I would mm. stick it on my bed where I slept so that when I woke up every morning, I could see the uh, $10 million that I required to start the business. Mm. And believing it and working towards it and going every day with that determination and passion and uh, putting all your struggles and energy and sacrifice into that business, I am assuring you the cash will start running after you. Uh, so just start. Do not be scared to lose. Whenever you're afraid or you fear, that's when you will never be able to achieve anything. Just start with what you have, even if it's very little, uh, and then it will just start paying itself. So just go out there and start. There's no losing, it's always learning. So even if you lose all that cash, you can start again. Remember, it's not going. It was a good learning opportunity. Just look at the glass half full and be positive, and you'll never have a cash problem, I, I believe. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I would recommend as well, uh, Elizabeth, to read a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Kries. I feel like it's very relevant to your question because not every new trial and experiment in your business has to cost you money. What The Lean Startup does is it basically uh, champions the use of innovative ways to try out new things without having to take your much needed cash flows put out to the market. And customers are always ready to talk to you, I'm sure. Uh, I, Robley talked earlier about customer feedback loop in his in his, uh, in his his presentation. And it's a question of picking up the phone or sending out a survey or you know doing what we call even paper prototypes. And, and I'm sure Prof has a lot he can say about, um, about that. Uh, any other thoughts from the panel just around this question of cash and finance? I, um, I, I feel like one it's the big one we need to scratch a little bit further. Yeah, one caveat um what don't don't do what you see other people are doing uh, find and find something that the people i mean if you find someone selling bananas and you sell bananas you are going to kill yourself so try to find the need and, and that's what we call the value proposition that you are giving if the value proposition is compelling it doesn't matter you would get the money and uh i would also just i i feel maybe um uh there's one area of cash preservation that i think uh, was being overlooked here in terms of cost so yeah. a lot of businesses we're talking about existing businesses uh their overheads are not aligned with the demand that they're having some of them have to uh preserve cash by lowering their their overhead so that's also another way that businesses can preserve cash is lower overheads to align with the current market demand. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that. There's, um, I don't think there's ever a conversation about entrepreneurship and business where this question doesn't come up. And, and so I want us to just tackle it. And I'll just read the point first and then pose the question to the panel. As consumer, and this is from Duncan James, as consumer changes and market dynamics unfold pretty fast, the state, and I believe by the state he means the government, seems left seems uh, left quite far behind. The state is needed to play its core function and roll out policies to enable these changes so that innovation can thrive. A review of all economic sectors is necessary uh, by state policy makers. 
uh, Prof, in one of your articles uh, in the Business Daily, which which is a fantastic uh, a series that you post every week, I encourage everyone to really give it a read. And in one of them, you, you spoke quite a bit and spoke highly of what Telcom and the government and Google have been doing with Project Loon uh, with enabling access in remote areas. I can already uh, picture the effects of that, for instance, in the education sector with the discussions we've been having. But I don't know what else you'd like to add uh, in reference to business and the new normal, uh, where you feel this topic of state and government and laws uh, needs to be thought about. Yeah, the, 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 the fact is, I, I normally see people complain, um, complain so much, oh, what about those who are in, who can't access this? In this country, 95% mm. of the population has access to broadband. So what people need to ask the government is actually to subsidize broadband and the rest would happen. But everybody keeps on saying, oh, because there are those who don't have a computer or don't have whatever. Uh, and, and we could mobilize and actually provide every child with either a smartphone, a tablet, or, or any gadget that puts them online. Um, mm. and, and eventually, that is what we are going to do if this thing doesn't uh, end by the end of the year. We would begin mm. now to think differently next year because of fear and we may have another lost year but it, it yeah. the trouble with us is that we complain fast we don't provide solutions yeah mm. most of us went to rural schools and if we said you mobilize for this school where you went and get this is the number of people who have no this we could we can do it i mean it, mm. it has been done before in some other aspects but in this time, I urge people that we come together, make sure that every child has some gadgets to put them online and seek uh, from government that we subsidize broadband and everybody gets education. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Robley, you have some experience in this space. I know your first company, you had to pivot it because of some aspects of regulation. Uh, what more would you like to add to this conversation? Yeah, I mean, um, and I think uh, for the most part, initially when I, I read that uh, question, I thought somebody was asking for regulations. <laughs> and as business, you rather not have regulation, you rather be ahead of uh, uh, the government in terms of uh, them regulating your business. So a lot of innovators are always ahead of uh, uh, the regulators, uh, and that's just the way it is. But I, I kind of mm. understand in terms of resource allocation, and it's a very critical and important question, is where would the government be investing in moving forward, knowing that mm. they could be in this type of situation? Do we need those super highways anymore? Or do we need uh, to reinvest it in, 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 as Prof said, the virtual capacity, broadband and internet access, and those type of things, um, I know there's a, a lot of movements in the U.S. that people are taking back roads and allowing for more bicycle lanes and things like that. So there mm -hmm. is, as we're talking about innovation within business, there's going to be innovation within government spending and where they can prioritize, prioritize to adapt to this new moment. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, wow. It's already 12, 20 time, time really flying. I wish we had more time. Uh, I just want to quickly now come to just final words from, from uh, each of the three panelists before we can do the last poll of the day. Um, great conversations, a lot of things, and, and I love some of the comments. And I just want to read one here by David Movie, who says, I love the way the panelists have left me thinking how much has wasted away. True to it, it's not wasted until it's wasted. And I think Lorna is the one who, who spoke to that. I will be back soon with my success story. David, uh, go, and, in, I, and I hope that is the feeling that is there with everybody. So Lorna, let me start with you. Uh, what are the final words you'd have to say to our audience around innovating for the new normal? Thank you, David, that was very encouraging, uh, waiting for your success story. And I believe I will tackle the last question um, on what we need possibly. 
I, I encourage and I call unto the government and the policy makers, the NGOs, whoever is out, out there, just know that entrepreneurs are the people who are going to solve this crisis and any other crisis. Uh, so please come out and support. Uh, they're going to be the, the engine for growth post-COVID and even now. So as we look ahead to the new norm, please, the government, please provide these subsidies. We need them, tax subsidies, a provide enabling environment for even entrepreneurs, even procurement opportunities. I just see these opportunities out there, but they're given to able-bodied people. Instead of helping us to implement, uh, we can all work together and enable uh, green entrepreneurs and even any other entrepreneurs to come out and create the kind of impact that we need uh, so that we can move from margin, margins to scale. And um, I believe that all of us should strive, do not give up, just go out there and I'm waiting for success stories. And I'm taking this opportunity to thank ABSA Kenya. I've been very privileged to be a client of ABSA and you have been wow. And keep continuing helping to uh, helping entrepreneurs like me and the thousands of others who've been benefiting from the support. After all, you've been the, you've been the bank that is enabling us to do things. Keep it up. Thank you. Back thank, to you. Thank you very much, Lona. Those are very inspiring words as always. Um, Roble, uh, any final words? Yeah, thank you, Alex, for uh, hosting this, uh, doing a great job hosting. I wanna obviously thank uh, the sponsors, AFSA Bank, and the Grassa uh, Michelle Trust. Um, and, um, and, and thank you audience for attending. I hope you've benefited from it. Uh, all I'll say is um, uh, stick to the fundamentals, uh, preserve cash, make sure you uh, make it through this pandemic uh, better, stronger, and keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities. And, I, and so continue to learn and, and continue to be optimistic and, uh, and uh, you will um, succeed and we will all succeed uh, and come out of this strong. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roble. And again, thank you for staying up late into the night so that you can be a part of this particular conversation. And last but definitely not least, Prof, any final words? My final word is that um, if, if government truly wants um, us to recover very quickly, they must look at SMEs because SMEs employ almost 90 percent of this. So the support to SMEs, you actually support almost the entire country. And mm. any money that goes to larger institutions, you look at the, um, the, 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 the tourism sector, it was not necessary to provide money to hotels, uh, but mm. it was necessary to provide resources to SMEs because uh, we have we have the most of the country working there, and these are the people who drive the economy. So any stimulus should be focused to SMEs, and SMEs also must realize that digitization is, is real, mm. and that is what would take us forward. So we need to begin implementation and be able to understand what needs to be faced in the space that we are operating.